So this talk is going to be a little bit different from the ones you'll probably hear. I'm not going to talk about the technology. I'm not going to talk about agile practices or processes, or I'm not even going to mention the manifesto that much. This talk is more about how other business functions work. We're all, here's a quick call of hands. Who here works in IT in some fashion? Yep, most of you. That's pretty much what I expected. So this talk is not going to be about IT. This talk is going to be about everyone else who's not IT and how you can actually work with them to convince them and help them help you become agile. Agile, an IT division is not self-contained. It might be a silo, it might be a matrix organization, but you have interfaces to finance, to HR, to sales and marketing, to all the other different divisions and functions across the organization. So what we're going to talk about is how we're going to align across the organization so that you can be successful. So let's actually have a quick little bit of a question and answer here. What, where is your problem? Where is your pain point in your organization when you're trying to be agile? HR? HR, which HR policy? KPIs? Performance metrics, yep. Where else? Roles and responsibilities, okay, yep. Um, job descriptions, position descriptions. Who's the business? Marketing sales, very good. So uh, that's a fair um, misconception, and it happens quite often. Agile isn't faster. Agile is sooner. Um, and it's not necessarily cheaper, no. All right. So we'll talk about most of these things, right? and I'll, I'll make specific attention to call out some of the HR issues and some of the sales and marketing issues. So uh, just for those of you who don't me, my name is Evan Laybourne. I'm currently based in Singapore, uh, though my uh, I was grew up in... Uh, Melbourne, Australia, and Sydney, Australia for the last oh, 36 odd years. So, um, how's the cricket going? <laughs> not, not, not well for you or not well for me? <laughs> Beautiful. All right. Good to hear. All right. So, let's actually start with the core um, principle of why you're in business. Here's another show of hands. Think of your company's outcomes. Okay. What are you producing? Who are your customers? Is your company focused on a technology outcome or a non-technology outcome? Hands up for technology outcomes. You're writing software and selling it to other people. Okay, About a third of you. All right. And the rest of you are in supporting industries. You're producing IT software functions to support the rest of the organization, correct? Yes? Lovely. So here's... Here's what you need to understand. In those cases where you are not the, the outcome of the organization, where what you're producing is not being directly sold, you are a supporting function. You're there an, as an enabler to make sure that the rest of the organization can be successful and as, be as successful as possible. So in Jeff's talk this morning, he spoke a lot about outcomes. And this is actually very important to understand because you're often producing outputs. You're producing a capability or a function which needs to have a behavioral change, an outcome-based change um, that will affect your business. So think, what are your outcomes? What is your business, not you, not your division, not your function, trying to achieve? And I, this is homework for you. Write that down, not outputs. What, what's I don't care if you're producing widgets. I don't care if you're mining the Serengeti. Right? I want to know what is the outcome that your business is trying to achieve. Because you need to know that. You need to know that so that you can actually help position IT as an enabler. Not as an enabler of we're going to provide Microsoft Exchange, but we're an enabler of we're going to provide an outcome and support the outcomes of the organization. If you can align yourself to the outcome, the way that you can achieve that, be it an agile approach or non-agile approach, 
is, well, it becomes much easier. So let's then look at something else. We all know enterprise architecture as a specific meaning, but I want you to think one level up. I don't want you to think of enterprise architecture as how all your software components all fit together. I want you to think of your enterprise architecture, the structure of your business. What are the silos? What are the structures? Who reports to who and why? Okay. Understand how it all fits together, and from there you can understand the value drivers. You can understand who is actually going to be your constraints and who are going to be your enablers. Does that make sense? All right. So here's the question that you're all here to understand. How can you be agile in a non-agile business? And the majority of businesses aren't agile by their nature. Business management theory since the late 70s, and in fact, if you go back really since post-World War II, has been very command and control has been um, very much along the order of, we have a market, we're gonna work in that market, we're gonna produce our products, and we're going to satisfy our customers. Great stuff, but we build patterns and processes and models to support and enable that. So what does this mean? All right. Think about it in terms of, once again, an architecture. An architecture is not the same as a, soft, a piece of software. You don't write your program, your software language to actually replicate and emulate exactly what the architecture says. The architecture is an abstraction. It's an abstraction of the pattern of how things should work. Your business, your business enterprise architecture, is exactly that. It's an abstraction of how things work in reality. Here, when we're actually talking about being agile, your organization puts in place these abstractions, these patterns, to try and understand and control the chaos that is by the very nature of business. Business is chaotic, it is a chaotic system. Things occur outside of the control of the business. There are, whether it's 100 people, 1,000 people, 10,000 people, or 100,000 people, and in fact, the larger you are, the more chaos, the more variance and ripples occur through the effect. What we're trying to achieve here is there's a pattern. There's a pattern that puts some level of control and understanding over that. If we don't know what that pattern is, if we can't work within that pattern, well, we're gonna be completely stuffed. There's no way we're going to actually be able to, going back to the first slide, understand and align ourselves to the outcomes. But those patterns aren't agile, and we are. So how do we actually do that? So let's look at a couple of common interfacing functions. Now there's three I wanna talk about primarily here today. Okay, the first is gonna be finance, then I'm gonna, and I'll spend a little bit of time about that, but I will focus a lot more on HR, and I'll focus on sales and marketing. And if anyone else has any other questions, just pop, them up, pop up the hand and we'll um, try and address the questions as we go. So what is finance responsible for? What do they do? Cash flow. Hmm? Cash flow? Accounting. Accounting. Account receivables, yeah. They're responsible for making sure your business continues to have money. Right? They're not the sales, they're not there to convince people to get new money in, they're, there, they're a hygiene process. They're there to make sure that the money that comes in is treated in an appropriate way, is managed appropriately, they manage the budget. Who here has an annual budget that they work with? Who here has a three-year forecast? Who here has a five-year forecast? No one has a five-year forecast, excellent, all right. A lot of organizations do. Uh, and five-year forecasts are not agile. How can you be agile if you know three years in advance, even one year in advance, what projects are going to be funded? How's that agile? How's that taking advantage of the changing opportunities, changing market, so that you can actually adapt and change? You can't. It's impossible. So what do we do? All right. So first of all, you need to understand the interface. You need to understand what your interface to finance is going to be. All right, so once again, back to you guys. You tell me, what is your interface to finance? What do you do that your finance department needs, or vice versa? Budgeting, yep, absolutely. You're going to do your um, yearly bu annual budgets for your teams. Earn value. <laughs> Earn value management, yes. 
that's an entirely different uh, <laughs> conversation about why that's a bad thing, but let's leave that one aside. Revenue, project accruals. Okay? You're going to have invoices come in, and finance is going to want you to validate and accrue those monies. Procurement, absolutely. Are you actually going to be hiring, not staff, but contractors? Uh, are you going to be bringing in an external vendor? These are all things that you interface to finance. Let's go back to the question about outcomes then. What does finance want from you? Not, we know what they're going to do. We know that they want you to do recruits. They know that they want you to write up a, a forecast budget so they can plan for the next 12 months. Why? What is the outcome that finance is trying to achieve? No. Payables being done properly is an output. Okay? Like, that's a hygiene activity. It's an output of what finance does. I'm asking what the outcome is. What is the change? All right, start with you. Yeah, they want to enable the teams. Actually, that's a good one. Yeah. Financial health of the organization. Still not quite an outcome, but yes. All right. Predictability, lovely, yes, that's a beautiful one. Predictability, so let's look at a couple of these. We'll, talk, we'll take predictability um, in the first instance. Finance wants predictability, right? especially if you have shareholders, especially if you're a publicly listed company, because finance's stakeholders aren't you. Finance's stakeholders are usually the board. Right? They're there to produce and make sure that the board who don't understand the day-to-day -day operations of how this business is, is what it's doing. They don't care whether you're agile or not. The board wants to know, and, the, and, and through them the shareholders, are we going to hit our revenue targets for the next six months? So what's a great way of predicting revenue targets or, or, or cost targets? Waterfall. Waterfall is a beautiful way of saying, this project, we've spec'd it out, it's going to cost $100 million over the next three years. If I'm finance, I love that because it gives me predictability, because it gives me a measure of financial health. I know how I'm spending and how often I'm spending. Finance doesn't necessarily like an agile approach in theory because for them it enables the chaos. It changes that predictability. Does this make sense? Yeah? So, hang on, let me just go back. got that far, thank you very much, but yes, you are right. It, it, it is false predictability. Right? Quite, uh, how many times does the finance department do write downs? How many times do budgets get, you do a three year forecast and the second and third year budgets get cut by 30% because the predictability doesn't actually exist. It never did exist in the first place. There's a false sense of security that comes from these sort of processes and, and it's actually quite misleading and there are, uh, a lot of companies have gone out of business or been a acquired um, because they've been unable to be competitive because they've had this false sense of predictability. Right? So I'll talk a little bit more about how we turn them agile in a second. Let's look at another function, HR. Okay? Everyone loves human resources, don't we? Okay? What is human resources accountable for? What do they do? Payroll. Do you want to get paid? I do. <laughs> Payroll. What else? Performance management. Line management? Oh, time management. Yeah, sometimes. Talent management, recruitment, talent acquisition. Training? Yeah, they often hold the training budget. Okay, so now, same question as before. What's the interface to you? What's your interface to human resources? What do you need from them? You need people. You need resources. I hate the word resources, but it is the term that is being used. Right? You need staff. You need talent. People to come in and do something, whatever that something happens to be. What else? No, no. Yes, that's it, but that's more of a constraint. Right? They will constrain you. They will give you a policy which constrains what you can do. 
Now, are constraints a bad thing? No, constraints are actually really good. Without constraints, it's hard to innovate. I'm going to question that one. I actually don't think that, um, HR does do that. I just don't think they should. <laughs> All right. So let's then look at the second question. What are their outcomes? Who's their stakeholder? What does HR, what are they trying to achieve for the organization? Okay. No. Sorry, I, I, let me just approach that one. God. Some organizations, yes. Some organizations, HR, yes. Employee satisfaction is an important criteria, and it's an important aspect of how that uh, organization and how HR will run. But in general, HR doesn't, isn't actually there for the employee's benefit. Nine times out of 10, for most organizations, HR is there for the organization's benefit, not the employee's. It's why if you have, um, if you have issues and concerns around uh, your engagement with your, say, your manager or so forth, it's usually better in the first instance to try and use someone other than HR to try and resolve those issues, either a direct communication, something like that. Because HR, they're there in, to protect the company's interests, not yours. Sustainability, sustainability of talents, yes. You want to have a consistent workflow. Oh, sorry, a consistent um, uh, uh, working community. Your staff, your staff growth. Mitigation of risk to the business. Mitigation of risk to the business, absolutely. Through? Policy yep, policies, sued. Uh, and hell, you've also got SOX compliance, uh, all sorts of regulatory compliance. Um, uh, each state, um, each country that you operate in are going to have different um, uh, labor laws, which you will need to comply with. So, so they ensure those, compl those compliance. So once again, HR is a hygiene process in many organizations. It provides other supporting functions in terms of recruitment and talent acquisition, but it also performs a hygiene process. Now, let's look at it from an agile perspective. What do you need from HR? We said you need people, you need staff. Absolutely. What else do you need from HR? Nothing. <laughs> that, that, that's it? Anyone? Do you need HR to define your roles and responsibilities of the people you want to hire? Yeah. If the organizational culture and the, and the, uh, and, and the process description says HR writes all roles and responsibilities, then I'm going to say that's how it currently operates, but that's not what you need from them. What you need from them is appropriate talent management. Right? The fact that they do these other capabilities is something that we'll talk about. Okay. So perf performance appraisal, absolutely. But should HR be doing that performance appraisal, or should the managers? Hmm? That's it. HR usually drives the process. They set a common standard so that I will appraise you and you and you in exactly the same way, without fear or favor. All right. Um, that doesn't always happen. There's always bias, unconscious and unconscious bias that comes in. But HR itself in most cases, isn't involved in the performance appraisal process. Some organization, I am talking very generically here, and I should have said this at the beginning, everything I say is generic. Right? Every organization has a different culture and a different way of operating. I, it's impossible to be specific to all of you. Right? So does that make sense? So let's now look at sales and marketing. Right? So this is, the, this is the third division I, I, that is a common interface to an IT team. What does sales and marketing do? Hmm? Yeah, so they will manage customers, they will manage lead generation. What else? Customer acquisition. Branding for the marketing, as for the marketing side of sales. They get products out and money in. Very well said, I like that. Yes, products out and money in, in all sorts of different ways. 
what's your interface to sales and marketing then? As an IT team, what do you do that sales and marketing needs? Or what does sales and marketing do that you need? So you, the, your interface is to deliver a product on time. Who sets the time? Uh, product, management. <laughs> product management. Does product management talk to you to ask you how long it's going to take? Or do they just say, we need it by the 30th of June? <laughs> You're lucky. It's, it's sad, sadly, in a lot of organizations, it, is, uh, it must be done by this date because this is when our marketing campaign goes live. Pre-sales, yes, absolutely. You, as an IT function, will probably be involved in pre-sales, understand the customer's demands, needs, what, what, their, what their pain is. Yeah. So provide the information so they can sell the product. Yeah. Sales and marketing is a division. It's a function within an organization. Your organization is going to be selling different things. If, if you're an IT company, then yes, your sales and marketing is going to be doing, is selling professional services. Yeah. Once again, generic. Right. So what is sales and marketing outcomes? I think you actually probably put it very succinctly. The outcome, products out, money in. All right. Does anyone have a better outcome for sales than that? I think that is pretty succinct. Oh. Oh, yeah, business growth, yes. It, it, it's, it's, a, it's aligned to that, but it's not just a matter of a, 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 an existing, I'm selling 10 widgets a year. I'm going to send 10 widgets, then 11, then 12, then 15. There is an expectation, the organization has an expectation of continual growth. It is the capitalist way. All right, so let's now have a look at business agility. So there's a natural evolution in business agility. Organizations are slowly over the last 10 years starting to realize that the command and control approaches of senior executives and management aren't working as well as they used to. So what does this mean for you? This means that we have a opportunity to actually help the business become agile. Now there's a couple of ways that this occurs and I'll talk about them in three different tiers. The first tier, is where you are agile and your interfaces to these supporting processes are simplified, streamlined in such a way to enable you to be agile. The second tier is where you are agile and you're helping and enabling these other supporting functions to be agile as well. Little a agile. They may not use Scrum, they may not use Kanban, though in some cases that can be quite beneficial but you can actually help them to take on these principles and values of agility. The third tier is, orga is full organizational business agility. Uh, and that is actually very hard to achieve and very rare to achieve. But just be aware that it does, um, many organizations will take that third step to organizational agility. And I'll talk about that just at the very end. So now, how do we help finance? So, I'm going to give you a couple of things, a couple of tactics that you can take and actually work with finance. Pain point number one of most agile IT divisions, the annual budget cycle. Agreed? We all hate the annual budget cycle. All right. How is the agile budget not cycle not agile? Well, it tells us how much we're going to spend on what project 12 months ahead, usually 18 months ahead because the budget's usually planned at least six months before the financial year. All right. Finance, and, 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 and this isn't an agile thing. This has been around for the last 20 odd years. All right. Finance has the ability to create what are called rolling budgets. Think of this as a, an abstraction layer. All right. Finance works in annual, in a yearly cycle. That is their cadence. Finance has to work in the annual cycle because that's what the regulation, the financial years, tax returns, all that, all those processes, that's their cadence. Right? So because finance has that cadence, they force that cadence onto the rest of the organization. What we can do is we can help them to actually obfuscate, abstract that cadence, 
finance can work annually, but why should you also have to work annually just because they do? By having a rolling budget, which is a, I won't get into the specifics in terms of the, the, the financial details, but it is effectively a month by month budget that will, there are spikes, shifts up and down, which may change depending on circumstances, but nine times out of 10, most monthly budgets will roll on from the previous one. Money not spent in one month carries over. There's none of this end of the financial year, spend all the money because we won't have it next financial year, okay, because it will go away. Right? It, is a, it is a means of ensuring agility in IT supported by finance. Contingency and trust. Team-based contingency is a very powerful way of enabling IT functions, even if they still have an annual budget, to be agile from a financial context. What is contingency? Your budget is for, let's say, it's an agile team, seven plus or minus two. Seven people, it's gonna cost us X amount, this is my team size. I, as finance, I'm gonna give you an extra 10% a month, 15%. It's very rarely more than 20%. 10 to 15% to spend at your discretion. It is discretionary spending. You can't go out and have a big party. It still has to be a business, a related business expense. But if by giving you that funds, which once again should roll over, if you need to scale up to a new uh, a contractor or a new product or tool for a couple of months to take advantage of a new opportunity, Okay, to meet those deadlines. You've got the contingency, you've got the funds available to actually, once again, be agile. Right? And let's go back to the outcomes of finance. You said it best, predictability. If I, as finance, even with my annual budget, give you a 10% um, contingency, I have a level of predictability, surety, of how much things are going to cost and what the flow is going to be. And if it's not spent, right, um, and if you're not spending your contingency consistently, then great, we'll, we'll reevaluate. But for you to be agile, for you to take advantage of change, beautiful way, but it requires trust. Your finance team has to trust you to spend that money wisely. Right? Contingency won't work without trust. And we'll talk a little bit about communication and trust building a bit. Cadence, flow, and transparency. Now I'm gonna talk about the second tier of business agility, and that is financial agility. Not IT agility with finance support, but actual financial agility. Okay, so, 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 so there's two points there. So the question was, for those who didn't hear, contingency is bad because you're always going to use it for day-to-day -day things. It's not necessarily going to be used for the innovation or those spikes of behavior. Now, so there's two points there. One is contingency is there to be used. So using it every month is actually not a bad thing. Right? And, and, and if you need to spend it to actually achieve the goals, the changing goals which are set to you by the business, then great, you're using it for the right purpose. If your baseline budget, however, is insufficient, contingency is not, a, contingency isn't, we'll give you 20% contingency, but we're also gonna cut your budget by 20%. That's not contingency, that's just a whitewash of agility. Like, it, it's nothing, okay, it's meaningless. So going to that second point of trust, they have to trust you to actually be honest with that, and if you say that your budget, I've got a team of seven, this is what my funds, uh, my costs are gonna be. I have a team of 100,000. This is what my costs are going to be. Right? The contingency is above and beyond my budget. Now, it might, it might be 5%, right? but it, it needs to actually be available. And interestingly on contingency, contingency should cascade. So if I'm the CIO of 10,000 10, people, right, I'll have a very large contingency but that should actually cascade down to my outcomes focused team. So each of my teams is focused on an outcome, an achievement. So I'm gonna say, this is your contingency, this is your contingency. So the contingency isn't at a department level, it's at a team level. 
or it should be anyway, once again, it comes to where that level of trust lies. Does finance trust the team leads or do they only trust the CIO? Okay. The trust needs to be at the level where the contingency needs to be spent. I wouldn't think of it as insurance. The problem with thinking of insurance is insurance implies something's going wrong. All right? I'm spending the money because something is going wrong and, I, and that money's there to, to fix it as a risk mitigation. The problem with having it that, thinking it that way is it stops you from actually innovating. I want you to spend that money to do something better, not just because something's not going as planned. Oh, uh, you can use it as an insurance buffer, but it, thinking of it as that has a cognitive limitation. All right, Cognit uh, so cadence, flow, and transparency. We're now talking tier three here. All right, we know the cadence of finances annually. All right? We need to understand what their flow is, and we need to understand about transparency. Agile, does Agile like transparency? Yes, it does. We are very transparent, open communication. The great thing about finance is finance is also very transparent. They are taught to be transparent. There are certain cultural behaviors which, from an Agile perspective and from a finance perspective, fully align. And one of those is transparency. So we can actually leverage the Agile manifesto and those aspects of agility to actually convince them that there are some parts of being agile which are beneficial for you. Right? And from an agile and from a finance perspective, transparency tends to be it. So let's now look at human resources. I'll spend a bit of time on this. Right. Metrics and KPIs, don't we love those? Those are our favorite things in the world, aren't they? So what do you need to do? You need to help them define what an agile KPI is. Why? Because you're not gonna get them to get rid of KPIs. Right? KPIs are pretty much a stock standard part of any business and has been for the last 20, 30 years, no more. Right? So because you can't get rid of KPIs, if you can't beat them, join them. We'll help finance develop a set of agile KPIs and associated job descriptions. It's not a matter of finance writing them for us, it's a matter of us saying this is what we need. What are the principles of agility? Cross-functional teams, collaboration, communication. We all agree? These should be part of our KPIs. These should be part of our job description. My job description should not say tester. Tester is not cross-functional. Tester is a function, a singular function. I don't want to hire a tester. I want to hire someone who has testing capability, but can also pick up and start to um, uh, do some uh, unit testing, coding, code reviews, someone who can actually sit with a business. I want someone who is cross-functional and cross-skilled. Right? I want someone who can work in a team. These are the KPIs that we need. Bonuses, team-based bonuses. Rather than saying, you met your KPIs but you didn't, therefore you get your bonus but you don't, but you're on the same team. That's, that's a misleading metric. Right? The team has an outcome. An individual as part of a team has an outcome. Bonuses and the, and the KPIs associated with those bonuses should be at the team level, not the individual level. Right? Once again, different organizations will be structured differently as to how this all can operate. But the point is, you need to be able to help and work with your agile teams, sorry, your um, HR departments, to help them understand how to be agile. And this comes to communication, we'll talk about that in a bit. Agile recruitment policies. Now we're talking tier two an agile HR process. Now, is that possible? Absolutely, I've got some great case studies of, actually, let me jump one forward, Kanban for HR. I've got some great studies that show that HR teams, they can't use Scrum because they can't iterate. Their cadence is greater than one to two weeks. Their cadence is daily. They are very reactive in most cases, right? So it, once again, different, uh, different HR departments may differ, but in general, their cadence is too short for a scrum-based approach. But Kanban, as a flow, as a, re as a way of dealing with a prioritized backlog of inputs, which changes on a daily basis, a traceable, trackable measure of activities to deliver an outcome, these are all things that are amazing ways of actually embedding agility within HR 
and HR loves it. Right? it I've worked with four, five HR departments in converting them to an agile business approach, all using a Kanban style uh, approach. And every single one of them, there has been a, uh, a, an empowerment effect for the HR staff. And we're agile. We like empowerment of our staff. It's the whole point of having that team-based, that facilitation, that team-based outcomes. Right. Now, one of the things about the agile recruitment policies, who here, when, or in your organization, if someone in your team resigns, do you take that job description, put it out to market, and replace that role? Is that how most of you work? Yeah. Now, what happens if you've got two applications who were brilliant? What would you do? You would hire one? Hmm? You can? That's the thing. If you don't have a, most organizations work on a position basis. If you don't have a vacant position, you can't hire both. It doesn't matter if both people will add value to the organization, you can only hire one or go through the six month set of paperwork to create a new position and the associated business case and financial processes to actually get the funds to hire the second person. A, a true agile organization, and we're now talking sort of tier three here, a true agile organization is going to look at an, a rolling recruitment process. I'm not going to have positions. I'm not even going to have job descriptions. I'm going to say these are the outcomes that we're achieving. This is our outcomes-based team. This is what we're doing. Do you think you can add value? Do you think you can work towards the outcome and produce something? If you do, here's our email address. Pop your resume, and we'll have a look at it. And that just sits there. That's a permanent job ad. It never closes. And I'll look at your resume and your resume and your resume and I'll go, you know what? Out of the la in the last month, these three people have applied out of 20 who I think are really good. Let's bring them in. Let's give them an internship or whatever your actual recruitment process is. But if you're going to add value to an organization, if you're actually going and think of value as outcome, there's a revenue driver. There's money coming into an organization. If you're going to add value, then I'm going to hire you because you're going to add a, a, a net revenue positive to the organization. And if you don't, I'll fire you. Right? You have a three-month probation period, use it. Make sense? All right. Sales and marketing. So sales and marketing is, funnily enough, the hardest to make agile. Why? Anyone have a guess? That is a symptom of why, yes. They have quarterly quotas. Anyone else? Oh, yep, you're pretty much it. What's in it for them? But root cause, five whys. Why is that problem? No, no, no. let's go with this one. Like, what's in it for them? Why? Why is that a problem? Why, can't, why isn't that agile? Incentivized based on what they sell? Why? <laughs> because that's okay. We've hit the, the cyclic point. Sales and marketing is, by its very nature, an independent, cutthroat, competitive behavior. Right? Because they have quotas to meet. Because they're just there to sell the product. I'm talking sales here, not less so marketing. So, by its nature, sales is actually very hard to make agile. All right. So, what do we need to do? First of all. We need to teach sales about collaboration. We want them to collaborate with one another in such a way that, uh, and with us, so that we can align the sales and the development cycle. Too often, and I'm, I'm now specifically talking here about if you're selling IT products, if you're not selling IT products, the relationship tends not to be quite so strong. Right? But if you're selling an IT product, and they go and commit to a date to a customer, then you're stuck with that date. It acts as a constraint, and you have to scramble to try and finish everything in time. All right? Whether it be a full-on custom-built system or just a configuration of, of a platform. All right? So what we want to do is align those sales and development cycles. So what the customers, sorry, what the salespeople sell and the development team can deliver is aligned with the customer's expectations. 
if you want to be agile, get rid of your sales team. Have sales people and embed them into your de delivery teams. Get rid of commissions. Commissions are a negative behavioral trait to agility because it, A, encourages that competitive behavior. We don't want co competition. We want teams. Two, there is a lot of evidence that shows that beyond a certain base level of remuneration, there is very little net positive value to bonuses. Three, bonuses drive neg uh, a further negative behavior. Even when it's a team-based bonus, they can actually drive a negative behavior around what do I need to do to get my bonus, not what do I need to do to make the customer happy. All right, so once you've got those sales teams embedded, once you've got those alignment of sales and um, delivery cycles, right, once you've got the salespeople to actually communicate with everyone, collaborate as a team, then you can have a highly efficient, highly functioning sales function capability within your organization. It is hard to achieve, but when you do achieve it, it is the most amazing thing you will ever see happen to an organization. Uh, I've seen organizations increase sales, mostly through um, um, repeat customers, by 80% by using this approach. Right. To be fair, that's my best case scenario. <laughs> not, um, not everyone's gonna have the, the same benefit, but these are some of the things that you can achieve from an agile organization. Uh, oh yeah, eliminating commissions. So, it all comes down to communication. This is the fundamental aspect of how we're going to achieve this. What's the title of this talk? Selling Agile Across the Enterprise. We're not telling them that we're doing Agile and expecting them to align. We're asking, we're using Agile. Agile is this great way of delivering products and services in an efficient way, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We know the sales pitch. But we need to give the sales pitch to someone who isn't IT. We need to convince HR that Agile, even if they don't want to be Agile, supporting us in being Agile is beneficial to the company. Let's go back to the very first slide. What is the outcome of your business? Why are you in business? Right. When you're selling Agile to someone outside of IT, you don't sell it in terms of how good is Agile, how effective it is at um, Scrum teams, communication improves. They don't care about that. Right? It's about those outcomes of the business. So you need to find those business drivers. Right. Actually, let me just go back one slide. You need to find those business drivers in terms of, here I am, I'm IT, you're HR. Right. How do I convince you? Right. Now, I'm here in India. There's a stereotype in India of um, haggling, right? of that competitive negotiation. The thing about competitive negotiation um, which we all tend to learn in marketplaces and, 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 and even back in Australia, we do. The problem with competitive negotiation is there's a winner and there's a loser. Okay? There's one person who gets their way and another person who doesn't necessarily. It only works when I can walk away. Right? I'll give you two bucks for this. No, no, it's going to be 20. I'll give you three. No, 20. Three, 20. Okay, I'm walking away. I'll go buy it from this guy over here. When you're negotiating, when you're talking with your HR department, saying, we're using Agile, and they go, well, you, as long as you comply to this, um, uh, uh, as long as you comply to this regulation, but we're using Agile, we need an Agile KPI. You've got to comply to this regulation, but, but you have to comply to this regulation. You can't walk away. You can't walk away and go to the other HR department and ask them, okay? So this is a, this is a negotiation strategy. This is something that you're going to need to actually start doing with these departments because you can't lose. Not you can't lose in terms of you're always going to win. You can't lose because if you do lose, right, that's it. It's over. You're stuck with an agile IT team that has all these complicated and very inefficient interfaces to non-agile departments. You can't afford to lose. So, 
I want a volunteer from the audience. I will pick someone if I don't get a volunteer. Uh, I won't pick you. Yeah, come, up you go. Now, stand there. Face the audience. All right. So, we'd like to introduce yourself to everyone. Who are you? It's very learning. I thought that I knew all about Agile and Scrum for, for a long time, but I knew that I know nothing now, and the real learning will start now. Speaking with guys like Diana Larson, Jeff Patton, now Ivan, this is a different perspective altogether. All, all, all together, for example, business, right? It's BU and silos. I realized that we are operating in that, and just now I had this realization. Okay, so has this talk made sense to you? Like, have you been able to, to get some ideas of how you can be better in terms of business? Of course. And it all makes sense, what I'm telling you makes sense? Yes, yeah? yes. All right, so tell me a little bit more about the work that you're doing at Cisco. Okay, I'm a Scrum Master, so I serve about five teams. I also uh, serve about four other teams indirectly. I uh, handle, uh, I help my architects and product owner to, in grooming. I do conflict management, negotiations part, cultural part, basically I'm the scrum police, <laughs> without a danda. Okay, so where are the issues that you're finding in terms of, you've got agile here within your scrum teams, you're being the scrum police, but you've got all these sort of surrounding systems and processes. Where are those issues? What's happening there? Okay, uh, we have been doing agile from uh, last one year and we are pretty successful at that. Challenge is how do I scale to the next level? People are bored of ceremonies. People are bored of uh, uh, stand-ups. A lot of other guys, we know what works. We, know, we don't know what works, okay, and we are okay with it. Right now, you brought a very interesting point about contingent workers, right? For example, now, after that, earlier we didn't have any contract negotiation. The, the, one of the clauses in the contract that team should be having, the, the, the onboarding team member should be having a basic knowledge of Agile. Right now, I'm thinking that I will add that clause in the contract. Okay. Because it helps that to speak in the one language. All right. Um, so do you need any help in your organization in doing this sort of stuff? Bringing in a consultant such as myself to possibly help in some way? Yes. But this scope of influence and scope of, uh, what is that, one more thing? Concern, right? Yep. Yeah. So concern is there, influence, I'll definitely try. No, absolutely. So just as a reference point, my daily rate's around 4,000 US a day. So is that something that you'd be able to accommodate? You're way, you're way, way, way costly. <laughs> All, right. All right. Thanks. So we can go on for the, we'll, we'll stop there. I, I think you get the idea. Know when to walk away. So, to, so did that make sense? Okay. We're building a relationship. Okay. I'm building credibility. Right. If I'm talking to HR, if I'm talking to finance or sales and marketing, I want to have that level of, cre of credibility with them. I want them to know that I'm not just here to sell Agile to IT, but I'm here to go, look, I understand the outcomes of HR. I understand what you're trying to achieve. Okay? I know how you work. So I'm credible. When we have a conversation, okay, it's not just an us versus them conversation. It's now, it's like, okay, I believe you. I believe you know what you're doing. So then, from the, once you have credibility, you can build the relationship. Once you have that relationship, you can start to then have those conversations around change, improvement. Right? Credibility and relationship are the first two points. You don't even talk agile at this point. You're talking, what are the pain points of HR? What, what pain do we cause you that we can try and fix? Right? Have that relationship. Find a concession point. Now, I, I didn't actually do that because I didn't have the opportunity in that conversation. But find a concession point is more around there are things that you can't win. All right? Find out what they are before you begin. All right? A very good example, external legislation, labor laws for HR, okay? tax law for finance. There are certain things that you can't win on. Know what they are and be willing to give them up. All right? Naming the first price. Now, interestingly, you did a counter tactic, and I'll explain that in a second. If you name, if you name the first price, you can anchor the conversation. So in an agile sense, it's not a money conversation, it's an agile conversation. We're naming 
agile as the way to do it. We're not asking them, how would you do this, and hoping they say, oh, agile. We're saying, you know what? Agile is going to help you do this. We can actually help you do it in this way. Now, the counter to naming the first price is actually to ridicule the first price. All right? yeah. So um, be aware that there is a counter to that. Ask questions. Okay? Let them understand that you're actually interested in what they want. All right? And know when to walk away. Okay? At a certain point, you're not going to be able to win the conversation. All right? And basically, you just have to go, all right, we're just going to have to find a way to work together. Does that make sense? Any questions about any of this? No? All right. Two final points. First, find the value drivers. What do I mean by value drivers? These are the... No, let me take a step back. What do I mean by value? What is valuable? What's valuable to your organization? Income. Absolutely. So when I say value drivers, I'm, I'm saying find those levers. Find those controls in your organization that you can pull and leverage and say, OK, reputation and income are important. I'm going to frame the conversation with finance, HR, sales, with everybody around those value drivers, the value proposition. Align the agile value proposition in IT to the value proposition and the value drivers of the organization. Then find the revenue drivers. Okay? Value drivers is a very broad statement. Okay? It's about what's important to the company. Revenue drivers is what makes the company money. And ultimately, you're in a company, you're in business to make money. Let's not shy away from that fact. You need to find the revenue drivers in your organization, understand where the money comes from, and find a way to align what you're doing to that, either as a support function, right, where you're enabling the revenue um, drivers, or as a direct function, where you're creating revenue in the first place. So if you understand your revenue drivers, if you understand the value proposition, and you can align Agile and your conversations that you have with HR, then you're in a very good position. So on that note, I've got about five minutes remaining. Any questions? I have. OK, so you spoke, I mean, you spoke about the interesting that embedding the salespeople into the teams. OK, so can you please dwell more into that? You have already a product owner. You have a product manager who interacts with the sales teams, so they all together make a strategy, right? So, for example, marketing guy, okay, his purpose is to create a customer. I understand him being in the business or the, the embedding with agile teams. I understand that, but can you please dwell more about the sales guys embedding in that? Yeah. So okay, in the life, sales is. Let's separate sales from product ownership. Okay, product ownership and sales can be one and the same. Right? Um, or they can be separated. Where they're separate, where you have a product owner, the product owner tends to represent the customer. They represent the person who wants a product, wants something being created, whereas sales represents the business. Sales is there to sell a product to the customer. So the product owner tends to come after. What you can think of in terms of is, I'm really talking about turning sales from the traditional um, boots on the ground, knocking on doors, selling a widget to account management. All right? I have a product owner. I have a series of product owners who represent the customer. I have sales who act as an account manager to actually ensure they the continued alignment and, that the and, and to get those revenue drivers flowing again and again and again to ensure continuous and repeat business. Other questions? We found that we have a delivery team which is deeply embedded. They're kind of account managers. And we found that it is way more counterproductive because uh, last time we created 31 versions of the estimate. <laughs> 31? <laughs> OK. What? There's a whole series of questions I have to ask there. Uh, I probably don't have time for all of them, but maybe we have a chat afterwards. But my first question is, why are you estimating like that? What value? Where's the value? Where's the value? 
<laughs> no, here the problem is more deep rooted, where the customer has not bought into a jail. Okay, so the whole value chain is not there, and that's why these are the symptoms. Yeah. Uh, okay. If, if when you don't have a buy into agile from a product owner, from sales, or from a key people in your stakeholders, and that's the whole point of this conversation, is that's when you have those breakdowns, and that's where you put in. You put in all these workarounds to make it work. What I'm saying is you shouldn't have to have those workarounds. Right? If you have that conversation, if you have the ability to build an agile relationship, even if they don't go agile, even if they don't use Scrum or Kanban, right, at least get to the point where you can have that conversation with them about how can you have that agile interface. And if they can't buy in, if they don't buy in, then you, sometimes you do have to know when to walk away. There's a point you made when you talked about sales and marketing being one of the most difficult uh, nuts to crack. Uh, I didn't quite understand it because I thought they had quarterly cycles, which is better than yearly cycles. And uh, the cadence is, is irrelevant. Like agile, you'll find nowhere in the agile manifesto a line that says we will iterate weekly, or monthly, or quarterly. There's one of the principles, and I should be able to do this from memory, but I can't. Uh, is around with a preference for shorter time scales. That's it. Agile isn't about doing it faster. It's about collaboration and getting the right outcome. Even that's not what I'm asking. I'm asking, uh, they actually have shorter cycles compared to finance. Yeah. And yet you're saying it's more difficult for them. Because it's not about the cycle time. It's about the collaboration and the communication. They're competitive. They don't have a team. They will okay. fight with one another. Um, and and like okay. in really bad organizations, they will steal clients from one another in the same team. That's as far from agile as you're going to get. And you need to break down those behavior patterns to even have a chance of having a level of agility in sales. All right. Uh, it depends on the size of the organization. Um, uh, if it's a smaller organization with one salesperson per region, yeah, sure, you won't have a direct competition. Uh, but a lot of the larger organizations where you'll have three, four, five uh, organizations, and I, I'll use a consultancy as an example. A consultancy I recently worked with, and I won't name names, um, uh, in each major city, they had about 10 sales. And each, each one had a company that they were responsible for, but they were always trying to poach work off each other because their bonuses were individual. And so if they could bring in a sale from, from someone, it didn't matter who, like, to the company, so it's that behavioral change. Sure, you're not going to have that competition where there's one salesperson, but at the same time, one person isn't a team. Right? If you have one salesperson, it's not a team in and of itself, and you may as well align them uh, into the development cycle then so they're part of a team. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I think it depends. It, it always depends. Every, the answer to every question <laughs> I get asked is it depends. <laughs> Anyone else? All right. Um, if you have any other questions about business agility or anything like that, come and have a chat with me. I'm the one in the three-piece suit. I have a couple more talks on fixed price contracts and value stream mapping on Saturday. So um, feel free to come and have a look with me. And if Australia wins, um, then I'm very sorry. Uh, I'll see you guys later. All right. Thank you very much.